Hello everyone and welcome to Blogist the 10th of 2016. I'm Waira oh. here alongside Roloti. That's and, uh, me. That is you. And uh, we actually don't have any like super special Bleach subject this week. Uh, yeah, everything lined up so perfectly when we thought Bleach was ending this week, and then we found it, out it was it's so not. perfect. We had everything prepared. We're gonna have something special every single week of Blogist. We're gonna have Zombie Power, the, the last chapter of Bleach. Then we've got three different topics that we can talk about Bleach, mm -hmm. and everything will be fine. And instead, no, Bleach actually isn't ending this week. It's ending in two weeks, which throws everything off. It'd be fine yes. if it were next week, but no, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, I still don't even actually know what we're doing next week. That's how badly it threw things off. Uh, okay. Um, we'll figure something out, I'm sure. But uh, in the meantime, we're instead making our special topic this week, the last chapter of Nisekoi. Yes, a, so... a series that knew how to end itself on time and not <laughs> mess up with the manga podcast-related schedules out there. Because <laughs> that's what you should always be thinking about when you're planning out your manga and it's going to take. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Thank you, Naoshi Komi. You knew how to end a series properly. Kubo, so, like, next week it's just Kubo, just like, I apologize, I've been waiting, I've been making the manga podcast wait more, too long, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna release it early in a non-existent magazine format for everybody to enjoy. And, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's just, I was so broken up when I heard that Nisuko was ending. Uh, I couldn't... <laughs> I couldn't go on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I guess we'll do this. We're going to kick off the recap of Weekly Manga Recap with a non-traditional order. We're going to be starting with Nisekoi. Uh, got a little color page to start things off with. Uh, very different style, actually. Uh, Raku's arm looks very sinewy. In it's that. watercolor, isn't it? It must be. I, mean, I, I would assume so. Given the background, especially. Yeah, it seems to be so. I actually really like it. It's 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 very. Um, how do you? I'm trying to think of the word for it. I don't want to just say beautiful. It feels like a word that's almost understated when you say it now. But um, I guess majestic. I don't know. It's it's a very attractive image. A very appealing. Very uh, um, very much to the tone and theme of Nisekoi. Very appropriate for a conclusion. Well, it also looks you know very storybook like. That's it. I think that's what I was is. You know, it's, a, it's appropriate given all of the, you know, themes of promises made and, you know, basing their stuff off of a promise that they got the idea for from that book that Rocky's mother wrote. So, I think it's very appropriate. Yes. Um, and it's the final chapter, Promise, which <laughs> is, um, a time skip happened, um, as yes. we probably figured from the last chapter, and we get to see where all of the <laughs> cast members are. Shut up. Uh, all the main cast members are uh, at this point after a couple of years have passed uh, Raku is now the leader of the Yakuza family which was never a focus of the series <laughs> no he always seemed to be the inappropriate person to lead his organization because he wasn't a thug in any it, real way and he always seemed the most normal out of his entire group because uh, uh, well I guess you know Shu and Ruri were you know very normal and Onodera was like oh well she's in a candy shop whatever but you know when you consider Chitage was the, was uh, the mistress of uh, of a gangster family Marika was the daughter of a police group Yui had some sort of weird Chinese mafia connection uh, and Tsugumi was the hitman the it never really came up the fact that Raku was a member of the Yakuza family. That was that. That was, I think, literally never a focus of the of the series. Like Sugumi got up to stuff. There was some stuff involving the Beehive. Never Raku's family. Yeah, it was mostly there for the premise. I think what's surprising for me though is that this wasn't that long of a time skip. It was only like, like in his early two years. Yeah, I think he's like right around twenty or so. I'm maybe not even that old. They were fifteen at the series. Well, this... when the series concluded, they were finishing up their last year of high school. So, so it'd be I... like 17, 18? No, I think that, I think that uh, a couple of years have passed. I think that they're basically fresh out of college. All right, so like around early 20s. Even still, so. Still, I'm just saying that seems early to be the head of a mafia family. But hey, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic series. They can do what they want. You just pull off that, that uh, kimono pretty well, I think. I think it's because he has a non-plus, like, 
I don't give a shit look on his face right there. Like, it's just him, like, what? can you Goober stop being Goobers right now? <laughs> uh, and he says that he actually has a job as a civil servant at the at his city, city, city hall. So it's weird that <laughs> corrupt politics. <laughs> uh, but I also love how, like, dismissive of the whole, yeah, I'm, part of, I'm the head of a f- mafia family. He's like, I understand now that we keep all the rabble out. <laughs> We're actually heroes. We're the good people. <laughs> it's like, this seems like it could be the premise of, like, Raku's descent into, self- into self-deluded crime lore territory. <laughs> No, we do a lot of good for the sin. We provide protection to the people who need it most. You know, you don't want those disorganized, anarchistic people around here causing trouble. Pay up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I, uh, I, I believe that in this scenario, I, I'm the good Samaritan who's, who's come into this city <laughs> to, to aid it, to help it recover and God damn it, we came across struggle. this rebel. Like- we would have been doing Nizakoi every single goddamn week if we had known that Raku would be the kingpin. God damn it. Four years we could have been doing this. Well, two years, because we didn't know what the kingpin yeah. sounded like until two years ago. But two years! It's <laughs> the a, kingpin the, Raku. The very oh. end of the chapter, he's just like, but then I realized, I am the ill intent, and he just fucking like, kills Shushu. Like, oh no! <laughs> Credits. False oh my love. god. Oh man, um, says we get a little bit of him talking with his dad, who's in stereotypical vacation gear, fucking tourist Hawaiian shirt and wide brimmed hat and sandals. Uh, he says that he's gonna go uh, meet up with Raku's mother, and they're gonna have a second honeymoon together. Oh, that's nice. Um, but uh, and so he heads off, saying, "Don't worry, I'll be back in time for the big day." which I can only assume is going to be Jutta Gainrock and getting fucking married. Uh, they establish that uh, Claude took over for the beehive uh, from Chitage's father, which is a far more appropriate conclusion for that whole organization and also Claude's character than Raku's the new head. <laughs> to be fair, I forget his name, Bosco or Bosbo, the, the second in command essentially of, the, uh, of Raku's gang, was never really made to be a significant character in the same way Claude was. Because Claude was an antagonist in the series. This guy was just, here's someone who's not the boss that Raku can interact with that is notable in some way. Yeah, and uh, he was established as Claude's, like, rival yeah. at the very beginning. When, you know, when it was, when they first had to start up the False Love Act, um... Yeah, Boz was the one who uh, was the most prominent in Raku's group, and of course Claude was the most prominent in Chitage's, but yeah, like you said, Claude was a much more... He, kept up with a lot more he never bought in into the relationship, whereas uh, Raku's followers were just like, we're so happy for you! Oh, dude, you're great! You're the perpetual best! perpetual virgin, you! <laughs> uh, so... Um, we get through that, and then we go around to some of the other characters... Uh, he gets a call from Shu, and uh, Shu says, "Yeah, we got the invitation. Uh, we're definitely gonna gonna make it." And Shu indicates that he is the planner for the event. And uh, after they hang up, he starts talking with Ruri. It's evident that they seem to be living together now. Uh, and uh, yeah, Good they're a teacher him. and translator. Yeah, Ruri's gone on to be a translator. Shu's gone on to be a teacher. Um, and uh, I, I like the little interaction that they that they have, where she's just like, "Oh, maybe we should get married." Married then, and Rory's just like, "Well, then you better start saving up because we got jack shit for money." <laughs> <laughs> Broke as fuck. But she, but they both look happy, and it's like, "Oh, that's nice." That's you know? important. Yeah. Don't vote. Don't go play it up and be do this big mushy thing. Just like, oh, good. Um, we you, cut over to. Do you think there'll be this many happy endings in Bleach, Nick? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, she also calls up Kiko Sensei, uh, their old teacher. She's got a little one hanging out with her, uh, and um, apparently they haven't seen each other since uh, she first left. But she is going to also be attending the wedding, and they, you know, have a little bit of uh, talk about stuff. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm I'm glad that we're gonna get to see each other. I want you to meet my ki- my kids, and so on. Yeah. Then we get to. Uh, 
uh, Haru and her friend, who was never important enough for me to remember her name. <laughs> she, she would show up occasionally as her, like, confidant, but really that was it. Um, she never really did a whole lot except just be the person Haru would vent to. Essentially, she filled the role as Ruri, as the Ruri to Haru's older Onidera, but uh, she never really did a whole lot. Um... But they indicate that Haru has actually taken over uh, as the sweets shop owner, uh, although she is still a bit despondent because she doesn't have her love interest uh, yet. No one's come along for her. Uh, chin up. I'm sure that someone will want to own a candy shop with you. <laughs> yeah. It's a dream job for many people. Not Nick. That would be his hell. <laughs> oh, chocolate everywhere! <laughs> There's no brown sugar Pop-Tarts? Why don't you make those? <laughs> She's like, why why don't you only make those? <laughs> She's like, because they're trademarked. I can't just make them. <laughs> <laughs> we can call them top parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, they they also talk a little bit about Paula. I don't even know if you remember who Paula oh, yeah. is. Paula, Paula McCoy. She was yeah. uh, Sugumi's uh, rival, essentially. Rival, but also kind of. Friend. They, they were... Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> Apparently, she now works in a lab, uh, went to a grad school, and became a researcher. <laughs> Makes as much sense as, like, Ten Ten becoming a store shop owner. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. They also established that uh, Haru's friend actually is a journalist, and she's doing an article about, about Haru's shop, and is apparently spending way too much time talking about how Haru is, is single and cute <laughs> to help her hook up with some other guy. Which I do like that detail. Um, then uh, a little bit over to Yui, Yui, uh, who is apparently still the dawn of her group, uh, pregnant with a, a miscellaneous man's child. <laughs> Looks like it might be a second child too, because there's a baby no, at her feet. That's her follower. <laughs> her weird midget follower who was her. Ah, uh, okay. Um. <laughs> And this is the strangest development, I think. Yeah, this is a very strange one. <laughs> you remember how Sugumi was a, was a tomboy and was shy about how the fact she had a very developed body um, because she had been raised as, as a boy her whole life? Apparently she's a fucking fashion model who wears dresses with way too many holes in them that Chitage is designed. <laughs> I could understand it if it's like, uh, yeah, she's not hiding who she is. She's like, she's grown past it. She's accepting who she probably really is and she's not ashamed of being a woman. Like, she's she's grown and empowered by that. It's just right. weird that she's like, so I became a fashion model. It's just like, you were also like, a, one of the world's deadliest assassins. I'm surprised you didn't get into something related to like espionage, combat, political work even. It's, okay, modeling. I guess that they wanted... I, I guess that Komi probably wanted her to actually go on to something because True. this way she's not just still Chitage's bodyguard. It does just seem kind of weird, and she doesn't look especially comfortable <laughs> with being a model, which is kind of essential to being a model. Um, but... I, I, I don't know, especially because, because she's still apparently doing her model work while Chitage is not there. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, was, it was, maybe it was also a sense of wanting to give her an ending that doesn't suggest she's in a life of violence at all. Because even for the characters still involved yeah. with the Mafia, they seem to like be peaceful, living with the family kind of deal. So maybe it was like, eh, we don't want to suggest she's still out there being violent or anything like that. She's found a peaceful kind of career. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, uh, Sugumi is talking on the phone with uh, Marika. I also like the detail that Sugumi just doesn't wear her bow anymore, but she holds on to it. It's the bow that uh, Chitige gave her. Mm -hmm. um, then we cut over to Marika, who is talking with uh, Honda, her bodyguard, rejecting mm -hmm many different suitors apparently but um i also like the detail that she's cut her hair short again because she knows that you know raku isn't going to fall in love with her 
Uh, and so she got rid of the long hair that she only grew because he liked. Um, but she also seems very content and happy because she's just, she's like, we have to make sure that, you know, I can find a guy who could possibly, you know, be more wonderful than Raku. So come on, there's no time to waste. She's really confident and uh, optimistic about it. So it's, it's nice to see that even though out, out of all of them, she's kind of in the same place that she was before. She seems content with herself. Mm-hmm. It was it would really suck if she wasn't because she was always the the very confident and out there character. Imagine if she was the only one who was just kind of like, well, I guess I'll try and find another suitor. <laughs> She's like, ah, uh, not for nothing, but uh, I guess I'm gonna go rest in the hospital bed until I die. Like, oh, she didn't recover. <laughs> That's so depressing. And then probably the one character's ending that I buy into the least. Because Onodera um, apparently made the wedding cake for them. Apparently that's her job now, is designing stuff. Wasn't she terrible at making sweets? Like, everything that she made was borderline inedible? I'm trying to... I thought most of the girls were pretty bad at, at making... Chitage with, Chitage with guidance uh, could pull it off. Haru, of course, was just really good. But Onodera's whole thing was she worked in a sweet shop and everything that she made looked pretty, but it was completely inedible. <laughs> well, I mean, we haven't seen what the cake tastes like. It no, could we have not. <laughs> it looks nice. Maybe she just designs it and she doesn't actually, like, cook it or decide how it tastes. Yeah, she works with her sister, so maybe that's the combo. Like, you know, Haru makes the food. And you don't like... mix anything together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you could go on Cake Wars and build those stupid tall structures all you want but <laughs> yeah, you fucking you'll make melted uh, glass candy sugar into like some stupid fucking mafia family on top of this cake but you're not <laughs> you can't mix milk and eggs together cause I swear to god it'll explode oh god um <clears throat> and uh then finally we see Raku heading out to meet up with Chitage who apparently they haven't seen each other since that time that they parted ways uh, in the last chapter uh, they greet each other and um, they did some they did something where they designed a new locket because okay <laughs> um, yeah God, there's a key stuck in this one too oh, and, God, I asked, it. and I asked them to gave another duplicate key to six other women I don't know which one I promised myself to? Nisa Koi 2. Okay, so according to this, um, I think I guess that they've actually... I'm not sure if they've met up multiple times, or if they have. it's only been, like, six months since the last chapter. I don't know. This is like, a it, lot to have happened within six months It's of the a lot to have happened. I'm assuming assume... that they meet up very occasionally because they have their own lives that they're trying to get in order and stuff. Yeah, I... I... If it's not that, I'd actually be kind of upset with this ending because it's that idea of like, oh, Shoot, they just became a teacher four months out of high school. <laughs> well, then just the notion of like, oh, well, they, you know, Raku and uh, uh, Chitoge spent a really long time away from each other, but it's okay, you know, years pass, but they still love each other, and that's the only way. I'm like, bullshit. You're telling me a girl like this in America, single, working a high profile job, no one ever entered her life that was a competition. Yeah, we don't we don't got a Bakuman ending to worry about. Apparently, they at least they seem to be doing they seem to have I guess done the long distance thing. Yeah, where so. they can only see each other very occasionally, but they still do see each other. As opposed to we must not communicate outside of texts until we both got our lives in order. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a lot more believable, and I actually appreciate that quite a lot. It's very modern too, honestly. Like yeah. We make sure our lives are in order. We'll keep in touch, but we've got to you know make sure everything's in place before we actually you know join our lives together. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they uh, Raku introduces the locket that he apparently had made specially, um, and uh, yeah, they Raku narrates like yeah that pendant that the three of us. You know, that we all buried here that day, the three of us decided together to make a new one. <laughs> this is so lame. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah. They. Apparently, they haven't kissed the entire time that they've been doing the long distance thing. 
I guess. Uh, because, yeah, they nervously approach each other and have an incredibly awkward kiss uh, with a lot of build-up to it where they're both blushing heavily and there's a lot of different frames showing them slowly approach each other. And then we end on this big two-page spread of the basically the view is pulled way back out to see the field that they're in and they're just kissing in the background. And then we end on a joke, which is only appropriate, uh, because apparently uh, their teeth kind of hit. <laughs> yeah. They're not good at kissing. They, aren't, they haven't kissed that. Because they haven't been like. kissing at all, apparently, the last four years. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I like it, though. It's it's That's the kind of, like, innocent fairy tale shit I think you can kind of pull off. Because I would buy into the idea that they think their love is so great that they won't be intimate in any way like that. But, uh, yeah, I think it's kind of a, a cute, appropriate any too. And I also like the realism, too, of, like, they don't have a perfect first kiss. They're like, ow! My two first! <laughs> oh, I got stuck in your braces! <laughs> oh, we're gonna have to go to, we're gonna have to, go to a doctor. Uh, um, but, you know, I, I like the... I like it. I don't love it. Um, but I'm satisfied with the conclusion of seeing where all these characters that have grown to really like have ended up. Um, there's not really a... I don't think that there's a single character of real importance that I can think of that didn't have at least a little moment to show what they were you know, up to. Um, yeah, I think about just about every yeah, significant character really gets shown up. Um, so I'm happy to see that. Uh Am I glad with how every single character ended up? Eh, I'm not upset about any of them. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad. I'm, I'm happy with this conclusion. Um, and uh, I, I feel that the real conclusion anyway happened two chapters ago. But it was nice that we got that and that we got some appropriate time to actually tie up some loose ends. Unlike what happened with a certain other series ending at almost the exact same time. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the weird thing about this is that the way this is ending and the way Bleach is ending are almost like the tale of two cities where, you know, Bleach is this 15-year-long series that is now having to rush through everything because it has no time to do anything and it's, it's going to have an unsatisfying conclusion for the biggest part of essentially the series. Whereas Nisekoi, it's only been running for I think five years or so, not even that, and it took months to essentially it's been wrapping up for months and its own very slow very deliberate pace you know uh, i think it was what probably like five months ago or something like that we were doing the first marika chapters mm -hmm. and every significant character got their own small little send-off everything was very fitting like it was it was a nice way i don't think you could really be upset as a fan of the series that you're like no they didn't do this or they didn't answer this like i think they kind of covered everything and mm -hmm. that's really awesome um as far as Nisekoi this... started up in November of 2011, so okay. it's been almost five years, yeah. So, I mean, as a whole, I think Nisekoi was a really good series. It's one I, that I believe we originally did a recommendation of it. I said it's really good, but it's kind of a tough thing to read week to week, and I, I still agree with that. I don't know if it's something that, you know, I was the one. Even at the end, it. there were some chapters that we didn't cover because it was just like, eh, whatever. And even chapters we did, usually it was just you covered them because I usually didn't have much to say, or I may not have even read it beyond skimming through it. Um, mm -hmm. It was just something that I enjoyed from time to time. But what I do appreciate about it is it's one of the few and maybe the only romance series from Jump that I've ever been able to say, like, oh, that was good. You know, I, I love uh, I love Koshi. I think he's an absolutely fantastic manga. I really am excited to see something else from him. Um, yeah, he's going to be publishing uh, at least a short thing in a couple of months. Yeah, so we're going to get something very cool from him. But I really appreciate this. This is definitely the the uh, best romance series I've seen in Jump by a long shot. And mm -hmm. it's I think it's going to be a sad thing that we're going to be without this in a magazine. Well, I mean, <laughs> I saw the previews for the stuff that they're coming out uh, soon. They are m immediately trying to replace it. Yeah. But that's just how Jump works. You know, when when a hole opens up, they, you know, get one of the trillion applic applicants for a new manga, and they try and fill that gap. Uh, they're, we're actually getting a jump start uh, in two weeks called Love Rush. Gee, I wonder what that could, what kind of series that could Sounds be. Sounds like some uh, circus-related battle manga, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
But that's just how it goes, you know. When when I, Nisekoi was honestly the, like introduced in the same way because uh, To Love Ru ended not too long uh, before Nisekoi started up, and they were like, "Well, crap, our big harem love comedy series is gone. We need to have a harem love comedy series to replace it." Nisekoi ended up being way better, <laughs> <laughs> far and away. <laughs> But uh, all that said, yeah, closing the book on uh, Nisekoi, so I guess we'll move on to Black Clover now. Yes, the recap portion of Week the Manga Recap. I... Well, we're doing it again. Cause we're doing another like recap. Different... Yeah. Shut it's up. It's like beginning it again. <laughs> uh, page 73, end of the battle, end of despair. That's actually a really bad title. Yeah. Um... Last time, Yami showed up with a new spell to completely finish off uh, Veto. Um, unless he can operate with um, half a body, I think that he's dead now. And, uh, yeah, he f- falls over dead as Yami says, Well, I fought you last just like you wanted me to, but I didn't feel any despair, so sorry. <laughs> so tough titties. Like, oh. So the other black bulls that fought Veto uh, rush in to embrace Yami and because Asta doesn't have working arms he uh, flying headbutts him not even like flying headbutt he like flying missile slingshots himself like I can't imagine how fast he had to be moving to do that to himself someone with two broken arms should not be that like enthusiastic (laughs) it almost seems like someone threw him I I thought someone threw him for a while and I was like nah I guess that is something Asta would just do that's why Noelle's not in that shot, because she's in the follow-through stance. <laughs> yeah, she, she's throwing them like a javelin. Fastball special! <laughs> uh, yeah, they're all super excited. Um, oh, I can't believe you did it! Uh, Yambi chases them off with his sword. He's like, ah, oh, you guys are all troublesome. Uh, Nero shows up, Nero the Crow. Uh, by pecking Asta in the head with a gem it's found. And it's it, it found the magic stone. So I guess they don't have to go look for that now. Say is it a step in the process? Just like, I found a shiny! Yeah. <laughs> I did the well, plot thing again. <laughs> um, the uh, Elder Mage embraces Kahono and Kiato. Uh, I've said, of course, that they've been heavily wounded uh, and then he uh, gets down his hands and knees in front of the Black Bulls and says, you know, you did a great job. You've got my you know, eternal gratitude because you saved the temple, so I will grant any wish that, that you ask for as the high priest. And you know, he says, okay, then we're going to take this magic stone, just like we said. And he's like, oh, okay, that sure. That was easy. <laughs> and like, what, didn't you, well, didn't you know about the magic stone, though? And he says, No. I mean, I, I looked inside your thoughts and saw you were looking for a magic stone, but what's that thing? How intrusive. How casually intrusive. But uh, then uh, Charmy shows up with Gauche and Grey. Um, Charmy's ready to fight because she was the only one who didn't get hurt, like, at all. She just got knocked out by one of the mages before. Um, but... Uh, they're like, well, we already won. Lazy bum. <laughs> uh, and a little bit of time passes, and all of the Black Bulls get uh, put up in the temple for the night. Because uh, Fineral used up too much of his uh, magic power in the battle, so he doesn't have enough in him to teleport them back. Uh, I don't know why they can't travel back with Noel spell, though they did it before, but okay. Oh, she's probably tapped out, too, because remember she used the Corrupt on probably... Magic for that attack. Yeah, using her uh, giant sea dragon attack. Uh, <laughs> and we get, so we get this big panel like, of like how all of the Black Bulls are taking the news. Um, and I like some of the little bits that we get, it's like how Gaush is just like, can't believe that we gotta wait here for a day before we go back. I'm running low on Marie. <laughs> it's <laughs> like that, it's his fuel source. It's that phrasing. <laughs> Uh, Finral's trying to flirt with Grey now that he knows that she's a girl. Grey is hiding underneath her blanket because she's embarrassed because she can't hide her identity. Uh, Charmy is hungry. Um, <laughs> Vanessa's hanging out in her underwear. And threatening to sew uh, Finral's eyes shut if he 
keeps trying to yeah, uh, yeah. pick on uh, Gray. Yeah. So good for uh, her. She's like the big and, sister that's and, looking out for the girls. And uh, Luck uh, saying that he wants to go fight someone again. <laughs> One track behind that kid. Um, but we also do get a little bit where Matt, where because uh, Magna just is like uh, we just we just got uh, beaten and we got nothing to show for it. This sucks. And Luck says, "I don't know. Well, that's just all the power that we've got right now. We just gotta get stronger." Um, I would have liked a little bit more uh, of an introspective moment on that, but I'm glad that they do. That that is at least weighing on Magna's mind. It's not just, "Yeah, we won." He's like, "Well, we won, but." It's not really because of anything I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then everyone uh, hears a raucous out, outside, and uh, the entire inhabitants of the temple are thanking the Black Bulls. They're saying they're the saviors of the underwater temple. Um, and so there's this moment where people, where they're like, wow, I can't believe these people are thanking us. Which honestly kind of bothers me, because... It's just the show and don't tell thing, you know? Like, it would mean wait, more, we've heard of this reputation. Go ahead. It would mean more if we'd ever had an instance where they really established people don't like the Black Bulls. Because that's the thing. They're the, they're the black sheep of the magic families, you know? They, mm-hmm. Nobody likes them. They're supposed to be made, of, uh, made up of screw-up and rejects. Essentially kind of what Fairy Tale was at the start of Fairy Tale, where it's like, they're the group nobody likes because they're just so unorthodox and weird. So it'd be nice where, in this moment, we're like, oh, they're actually getting real appreciation because people are actually able to identify and register the fact that these are very noble and great heroes. Um, and it is nice in that way. It just, I think it would be even nicer had there been a moment where we really kind of set up that these guys didn't usually get this kind of treatment um, or that they even cared. Um, it works. I, I do understand yeah. it still because there are instances, you know, from flashbacks and things like that, where characters have shown that they've grown up not being appreciated. You know, almost everyone's had that in some fashion with their backstory. Right. But you know, it still would have been nice to have, I guess, a moment similar to this, but in the inverse, where somebody has been saved by the Black Bulls but doesn't care, doesn't thank them, or something like, like that. Like, it was a minor it was a minor thing, like, maybe they were being attacked by some beast in the wild, and they quickly dispatched them, and they were like, oh, you're the Black Bulls, uh, you, you guys are dangerous, get away from me. Uh, you know, just a little bit more build-up for this would have felt it, would have made it feel a lot more satisfying. It's, I'm not saying that it's a bad moment, but it's something that feels like it hasn't quite been earned fully for me. I understand. I don't know if I have an issue with it being earned. I just don't think it's something that was well, maybe not earned significance. The, I'm not saying okay. If I'm saying if there had been more of a feeling that they needed this, then it would fe- feel. Yeah. It doesn't feel like the payoff important. that it's meant to be. Mm-hmm. Still, the shit because better I mean, than the way fairy tales done it though. Oh, I mean, because you know, like. When you think about it, um, the last time that there was a big incident where people needed being saved was when Asta, uh, well, they saved the they saved the kids uh, that had been kidnapped. Mm-hmm. The kids and the and the uh, and uh, Teresa were grateful to them. That uh, Asta uh, helped to save the kingdom when it was attacked, and the Magic King was like, "Well, now I'm going to you know." You know, I need your help to do this. He showed him appreciation for what he had done. So there's never been a moment where, especially Asta has done something, and people have gone, "Oh, you're one of the black bulls." You know, you, you think that this makes up for you being one of those rambunctious assholes? And you know, there's, there just hasn't been a moment like that. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, people you know, react to that, um, and uh, then we cut over to Kyoto and Kahono. Uh, who are, of course, still heavily wounded. Kyoto is, you know, missing a leg, and Kahona's voice is crushed. And Oil is really broken up about it. She's crying for her new friend and saying, you know, I, I, even though we're friends, I couldn't help you out. But Kahono uses her, like, psychic abilities uh, to say, you know, don't worry about it. You know, you protect her home, so thank you. You used incredible magic to help, to help do that, and I haven't given up. I'm going to get better so that I can go outside and sing again. So once I'm a famous idol singer, come and listen to me sing. And 
like that's that's nice. That's really cool little, little moments where you know you know despite the fact that this this drawback, I'm going to continue on with my tree. Very, it's honestly a very Rock Lee moment when mm-hmm. you think about it. Um, I like it a lot and, though, uh, so, because this is a series where usually the best case scenario tends to always be the conclusion. This is a scenario where it's like no, like Kahono's voice isn't fixed, um, Kaoto's leg is missing neither of them are going to be able to accomplish their dreams in the same way they were before but they're not giving up and that's i think the spirit of the series i can get the most behind uh, because it doesn't feel like this is going to be an easy thing so they're going to have to struggle to get Mm -hmm. to accomplish these dreams now and that makes them a lot more compelling having optimism in the face of odds like this is a lot more compelling than yeah we did it (laughs) Um, and now keep I used my oil. anti-sword to cut away the magic! Or anti-magic sword to cut away all the magic! I know what I'll do, guys! I'll just stab your throat with this sword and take away the damage that the magic did! Oh, that infuriated Oh my god, that worked! <laughs> I'd be so angry. Um, and Kyoto has a crush on Noel now. Well, okay. At least, I mean... At least there was a, a, a moment that sort of justified it. You know, where she feces like, you know, she saw Noel express very, he saw Noel express very deep emotions, and so that's what enchanted him, as opposed to, she was hot! It actually makes sense, too, because she is supposed to be a royal, so I imagine she's probably one of the most attractive people kind of around. It's well, kind also, of, it, he's heard the, he, he also heard the rumors of the sea goddess. Yeah, as so well, it, it would so. make sense that, you know, he develops a little bit of a crush on her. Yeah. And, and also, he's, it helps to get him motivated, too. He's like, I'm going to hurry up and get better and get my leg fixed so I can continue dancing, and I'm going to do a courtship dance for her. <laughs> Wouldn't see a fucking bird? <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, uh, um, there's a weird uh, little moment where uh, seemingly um, Yami has, I guess, doing a little ritual for the fallen Veto. I think that's who that's supposed to be. Yeah, that's definitely Veto. Um, he's you know covered him with a sheet, and he burns a little bit of uh, incense for him, referencing you know his totally not Japan roots. Um, <laughs> and uh, Asta shows up, and he's got both his arms in slings, but he's also somehow managed to gather flowers despite that. Probably, I'm assuming that the entire time he was, he kind of squint. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> ow, ow, ow. <laughs> oh, it hurts so much, but these flowers are so pretty. <laughs> I must leave them. <laughs> mm. Uh, so, yeah. You know, he's it's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, oh, I got restless and wanted to go exploring. And I came across these pretty flowers. So he actually lays the flowers down along with uh, the incense that uh, you know, we put down. And Asta says that although he can't forgive these guys. I don't know what it was, but something happened to them that they just can't forgive to. Something bad enough to make them hate that much. And I thought maybe this guy was the one who'd actually despaired the most. Um, which I think is honestly one of my favorite little moments from Asta. Because a- it opens, he opens up by saying, I can't forgive what they did, but I understand something bad must have happened to them to actually make them this way. Having awareness of that. This is the kind of attribute that Asta really needed. And I, I, I know he's, he's always had it, but this is, I guess, displaying it in a manner that really kind of makes a lot of his character more appealing. Because, you know, we've always known he's just an annoying kind of person. He's just the one shouting, I believe, and I'll do it. But here this is a case where, as you said, you know, he, he doesn't forgive the guy, but he sits there and he's like, but I think that this guy had something wrong with him. Because we saw that with Beto. You know, we know that there's some sort of situation where the the uh, Silva family did something irreparable to his entire clan. Um, so he has some sort of justification for why he was the, the way he is. And I like that Asta recognize that and is addressing it. And that it even ties it all back in together with the guy's whole despair gimmick. He's like, I think he was the one who was actually despairing the most out of all of us. So mm-hmm. it's a very touching way and it shows that this guy has this kid has a lot of heart and uh, it makes him a lot more of an appealing character uh, but then Yami just is like you're an idiot aren't you and he says idiots shouldn't t- think too hard about stuff like that idiot just focus on chasing that dream of yours for now at least 
and uh, this is like the most <laughs> he pulls Asta's headband down over his eyes and Asta's like ah I've got two broken arms I can't push it back up Captain Yami <laughs> It's a weirdly unsympathetic moment from Yami. <laughs> but I kind of get the idea. Like, he doesn't want his new recruit being having doubt enter into his heart because he's not mature enough to deal with those kind of conflicting thoughts at this point. Yeah. So. Exactly. I- um, I like this chapter a lot, and I think this conclusion to the, I don't know what you call it, the sea cave arc, the Veto arc, whatever you're going to call it, I think this arc's gone a long way to making me appreciate and enjoy Black Clover a lot more. Um, there were still issues with it, but I think overall it had a lot of really strong moments. It's developed the side characters of the guild a lot more. It wasn't just about Asta, and even Asta himself has started to grow and become a more... A likable character after all this and we had a villain who actually seemed to be uh, intimidating and still pretty uh pretty interesting in his conclusion so i really thought this was a good chapter and a good kind of conclusion to this arc mm-hmm. speaking of good conclusions <laughs> hey actually uh we're talking about bleach uh before we actually mention bleach though i need to i want to quickly bring up something on the show um I've been getting told by a lot of people that they didn't realize we have a weekly MVP section. So hopefully starting with this episode, uh, you're going to start seeing that at the bottom of videos now uh, with the the timestamp. So I'm going to timestamp that. But I think that also might play into the fact that some people don't always hear some of the uh, like after credits uh, plugs that go on. So I just wanted to throw out there. I, the next uh, upcoming bonus podcast for our Patreon account is a, a Bleach trivia contest between Nick and Tekking. Uh, I'm doing one game within that that I need some help from the listeners on. Um, I think I've been a little bit unclear with that, so some people haven't been saying it because they're not really sure what I'm asking for. Essentially, uh, for one of the games, I need to compile together a survey of answers from the audience. So I'm basically just going to be asking you five questions that you just need to give very simple responses to the bleach related questions um so if you're interested in doing that just send me an email over at weekly manga recap at yahoo.com i should get back to you within like a day or so and again they're very quick simple questions i'll explain all the details within it um and hopefully we'll be able to get that. i need about 100 people is the big thing so if you're interested at all it should only take a few moments and uh it'll help make the show a uh, really uh really cool moment so if you're interested weekly manga recap at yahoo.com and speaking of Bleach, it's the second to last chapter. We thought it was going to be the last, but I guess that was just some sort of... Um, Optical illusion. <laughs> you thought it was going to end this week. Uh, Bleach 685, The End of Flawlessness. Now, I've actually seen like um, a few people... Because um, apparently, I guess this title would have been in Japanese originally. In fact, I'm going to look it up to make sure I've got that right. I think it was originally in Japanese, and so there have been different translations of it. And so, one of the translations that I saw was perfect ending. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it was originally Japanese. I'm going to punch this into Google Translate and see what it comes up with. (laughs) Babblefish. Muketsu no Hate, which, uh, let's see, yeah, yeah, that means ending... Yeah, it could it could be interpreted to me to mean a perfect ending, but it's all but yeah, it, and it could translate a couple of different ways. But I, the fact that I saw it a couple of times as a perfect ending, I was just like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be a, a pun, like a perfect ending you'd normally associate with a, quite a perfect ending, but he's actually mean like, no, it's a perfect ending. Right, it's the ending of of flawlessness yeah. exactly. Uh, so this chapter is all about uh, seeing what's happened in ten years' time since the conclusion of the Thousand Year Blood War in Soul Society. That's a pretty significant time skip uh, for for Bleach. Uh, although, I mean, ten years doesn't mean a lot in Soul Society, but if it follows also in you know the real world, that's pretty significant. Uh, but uh, yeah, we catch up with all of the 
most important Soul Reapers. Uh, like, Shinsui is visiting Ukitake's grave. So he's, he's like, dead. He died. He didn't do anything. He's like, I mean, it's a sad, it's a sad thing that Unahana couldn't be here to, <laughs> to see you too. <laughs> oh, how fucking great would that be? Unahana came back, but not on screen. <laughs> They're just like, it's crazy, Unahana came back. Too bad she's busy and can't be here with us today. Exactly. <laughs> she brought flowers, though. For uh, you, Ukitake, who is dead and never coming back. <laughs> apparently, uh, they have finally rebuilt from all the damages that they suffered during the war. They even rebuilt, it looks like, the execution platform, which is kind of weird. Seems like something they wouldn't have wanted to replace. Yeah, right? What do they need it for? <laughs> I was like, I always, I never really understood why there was an execution plan. I don't know. I guess they'll say he has more drama than I think about. It has the power of a thousand Zanpak toes, which is why Ichigo broke it so easily. Well, he didn't break it, but he deflected it really easily. Uh, Shunsui then, after he, he, he he's basically converses with Ukitake, uh, his grave a little bit. Um, he said, he you know, kind of says to himself as if being called away, oh man, I'm, not, I'm still not used to being, you know, this busy, being the captain general. Now I know how great old man Yama was. Sure you do. Yeah, I love that line. But Nanao calls him away, and so he heads off after saying his farewells. We go over to Mayuri's lab. Mayuri's wearing another ridiculous headgear piece. <laughs> oh, God. What is that on his face? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. He's apparently expanded his network <laughs> across all of Seirete. Why are you giving this guy more power? <laughs> um... Actually, I should I should make note before I move on to that point. There's a little bit of like there's like a smudge of darkness that appears in the floor as Shinsui walks away, which I guess is supposed to be the arm that possessed Ukitake. Hmm. Possibly. Maybe there will be a real conclusion to that. Maybe there will be a spinoff of Bleach that will focus on that. No, please no. Um. So yeah, Mayuri is, uh, is, is heads off to do a field survey to, uh, I guess, oversee his new secret network, uh, and the new Nem Nemu is, is there with him, uh, Nemuri Hachigo, uh, who basically just looks like a little kid Nemu, but with very slight differences, and apparently um, he hasn't perfected her conditioning yet, because she's being too loud. Mm -hmm. Gonna have to beat that child now. <laughs> I think that this is actually more an indication that he's more successfully growing an actual person with more of a personality, though. I think that's supposed to be the, the implication here. Um, because he, it's not like it, it, it completed the opposite of what I just joked. He doesn't actually like, poof, he's just like, no. you're being loud. You, Stop being so loud, you He's actually acting like a parent to a child now, as opposed to a scientist to a product. Right. Uh, then we cut over to uh, Zaraki with Ikaku and Yumichika, and uh, they're like, Oh, how are you doing, Captain Zaraki? We're going through his squad. He's like, Shut up! <laughs> Fucking hate all of you! Um, and um, Ikaku says, uh, What are we uh, doing here? Why are we at Squad 1's barracks? Are, are we sure we're going the right way? He's like, what are you talking about? We're going to Squad 13's barracks. And they're like, wait, was it at Squad 13? Where are we Where are we actually going? And Zaraki says, listen, Ikaku, I used to get lost a whole lot, but it was only because of Yachiru. And now that she ain't here, there is no way I'll get lost. Which I want to point out, still does not resolve the questions I've been asking. <laughs> So Yachiru is gone. Does that mean she actually is Kenpachi Zanpakuto's spirit? 100%. Because I'm only 80% on this. Because if she... There are still unresolved questions here that I don't have the answers to, and it pisses me off. Everyone else is just like, what's he... What's a Yachiru? What's he talking about? <laughs> what's a Yachiru? <laughs> yeah. What's a Yachiru? <laughs> a Zanpakuto. Oh, God. Um... They run off. Um, Hirako and Hinamori overhear them, and Hirako's like, I think they're going the wrong way. And Hinamori's like, oh, I should go stop them. Hirako's like, no, don't do that. They're grown men. They could find their own way. Leave them be to get lost like fucking idiots. 
that's the resolution that they get. <laughs> Thank God. It's Not so weird the... to me. Shinji was such an important, or seemed to be such an important character. He's one of the few characters who's on, like, the title page of Bleach's first chapter. And he's someone who doesn't show up until, like, a hundred chapters or plus later. So he was clearly someone Kubo had intended to use. He had the design. He was given a big position of power as being the leader of the Visors. He was, like, the most significant one of them to get promoted back into being captain. And he had no relevance to the story after that. Or even we saw Kensei's. We saw Kensei's Bankai. We did not see his. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I, Kensei had some form of fight. I don't think Shinji even really had a fight against anybody. He just used his he, Shikai twice, and I think both times he died. Or not died, but he lost. You know, you know, Aizen basically schooled him the first time he used it. I forget who he even used the second time against. I'm just surprised that Shinji uh, didn't have... It was, uh, was Bombietta. It was Bombietta, because he reversed her senses, and she was just like... Okay, I'll just set explosives out everywhere. Yeah. And that seemed to work. <laughs> oh god, we did see Rose's Bankai too, didn't we? Mm. Man. So, uh, yeah. Like, nothing happens with him after he was introduced as essentially like the second Urahara. You know, because he instructed Ichigo and stuff. Hinori, nothing happened with her after after that uh, battle with Aizen, despite the fact that they made a big deal of if she could, you know, escape from underneath his influence. Yeah. Uh, but all that pales in comparison. <laughs> you know who did get some development? Fucking Captain Eba. That's right. The new captain of the seventh division is fucking Eba. What happened to Kumamura? I, know I don't a, know. I know he's a dog now. But what happened? All you would need to do is in the sequence where he's shouting up at, at his, uh, his at his followers that can't follow him because he jumped up a cliff. Is you know, to like somewhere like in the woods nearby where Comer and Fox Farm is overlooking him and then heads off back into the woods. It would take like half a page, and that would be all you would need to do in order to wrap up that loose end. That's it. And no, he's not in this chapter. What happened to him? There's still time for him to be addressed in the next chapter. He won't be. <laughs> but it's still just like, what happened? Like, Eva's been promoted to captain? Of all the various side characters within... The, of all, of, like, the quadrary characters within the Soul Society, I'm stunned Eva's the one to get a promotion like this. Like, Isane, I can kind of understand that. We've known a bit about her, plus her spot's, like, purely vacant, so it makes sense for her to just jump up. But, I mean, the same situation here is, too. But we know almost nothing about Iva. Like, the dude hasn't done almost anything in this series. Like, why doesn't... Why didn't Renji become the new Yeah, why didn't Renji? He, Kira? Like, he... They make see, big... Kira's a fucking half-robot! Why isn't he taking a new spot? <laughs> Well, because we established so, for so much of the series, Renji building up his Bankai and improving, and that's one of the big things becoming a captain. And Iba sent, mentions to Hitsugaya and Matsumoto as they come up, he's like, I'm nowhere near captain material yet. Like, he doesn't have confidence that he's actually strong enough. Like, yeah. So why... <laughs> I like to and think that he became captain because of that role where if you kill the previous captain, you become one. So we accidentally one day... He just, just like... to kill more into the woods. <laughs> yes, we're going to go and fight with you, Habak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was just like an axe. He was like riding his bike into work and just ding, ding, donk, donk. Oh, God, what was that? Oh, God, I think I ran over a donk. Oh, God, I had a coat. Oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, Iba says that to Hitsugai and Matsumoto as they're heading by, and Hitsugai says, oh, you know, that's actually an admirable quality, that you, you know, have that work ethic for yourself. Uh, and I, I think that that actually is, you know, a good quality for a captain to have. I really wish that someone nearby me had the work ethic like that. And Matsumoto's like, who are you talking about? Are you talking about Shuhei? And they look over at Isagi, who's also next to them, and they're like, and Kensei's like, no, yeah, I agree with her. You should pay attention to that. And then Isagi's like, wait, no, wait a second. I, I've been doing Bankai training. I've mastered my Bankai. What are you guys talking about? They're like, really? Well, why, how come we've never seen it? No, I have! <laughs> Everyone hates Isagi. <laughs> Apparently this just developed. People are just like, fuck this guy. I've never seen your Bankai. I've never seen it. Kensei's like, I've never seen it. But I've shown you it! <laughs> I know you've seen my Bankai. <laughs> I've shown you it so many times. 
Why did I just haven't had the chance to use it since you saw it? It's like, where are you making excuses for? I'm not making. <laughs> God damn it. But eventually hits the guy, he's like, well, no, see, the fact that he hasn't used his Bankai in 10 years, I mean, it's a good thing because that means that we've maintained peace for that whole time. Things have been boring, and now we can let our guard slip and become just as incompetent as we were before. <laughs> Uh, they show up uh, for the meeting with the captains that they're supposed to be at. Zaraki and, and company are, of course, the last to arrive because they got lost. Uh, and Soifun scolds them. Uh, and Zaraki's like, we took a lap around Serenite. I'd say we made pretty good time considering. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. <laughs> well, we took a, lot, a brief jog around the entire, uh, around the entire country. <laughs> Actually, though... That's kind of interesting. I didn't notice this on my previous readers. It looks like Kira did get a promotion of some kind. What are you talking about? It looks like he's to Shunsui's right. Like, now it's to his left, obviously, as vice lieutenant. I'm wondering if Kira got promoted, too, because it looks oh, like that's be, to his right. Might be part of First Squad now. First Squad or Commander, uh, what was it? Didn't, wasn't there um, a Keto Command? Maybe he's part of that. Although Keto a Keto Corps? Hmm. Something like I don't that. know. It might not be him. It He's also good. Like well, he does. It might not be, but I, I, I'm not even sure. But he also has a uh, a sash around his arm that uh, the vice captains tend to wear. So he might still be the third vice captain. I don't know. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So so if fun as Rocky get into a little fight, and then and Isane tries to tries to break them up, and she's like, "Oh, come on, just." Get, Come on, let's just go inside for the ceremony. Apparently she became the 4th Division captain. Makes sense. It's the Higeler Corps. The old top healer's dead. She's the new one. But weirdly enough, her little sister, Kione, who I don't even know if you remember who that She's is. She's one of the two who fought for the 13th God, uh, squad vice. Uh, see, Chris, you're learning in preparation for yes. the trivia contest, too. <laughs> that may have been one of my questions. It's been uh, dashed now. And apparently she is uh, her her vice captain, which honestly I think that that's an appropriate pairing. Having a very um, not very confident captain who's backed up by someone who's trying to push her to be better. I think that that could actually be an interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. It's a pity that we're not ever going to see it. Um, and uh, <laughs> knock on wood, Nick. There's still time for that sequel series. Yeah, it, it is possible. Uh, Manau uh, calls everyone to order and says that they're going to begin the ceremony to appoint a new captain to the 13 court guards. Um, and all the current captains line up. And um, yeah, other than the ones that we've actually covered, uh, it looks like Lisa is yeah. the new captain of the 8th division. Uh, apparently, you can go straight from hang out in the human world with nothing to do, straight to being a captain. I mean, they already established that with Rose and Kensei, so it's not honestly that surprising. Well, yeah, but, like, they did that, and that, but Hiori and Lisa and, uh, Love, I think it was, they just stayed in the human world. They didn't rejoin the court guards. Apparently yeah. they were just like, I want my old job back or nothing. <laughs> It's uh, apparently it's just a thing that you, if there's a captain opening, it's either gonna go to just the vice captain or to like fuck it, just get one of the visor dudes to fill in the spot. <laughs> and somewhere out there, loves sitting by his phone with his big stupid giant club shikai, just like any day now they're gonna call me. Thirteenth <laughs> squad position still open, any day now. <laughs> uh. We get a little bit with Renji, who is saying, ah, hey, you know, if you twist your ankle because of your nerves, I'll just carry you in on my shoulders. And uh, it turns out that the new appointees, the 13th Division captain, is going to be Rukia, which is not an incredibly huge surprise. But honestly, when you consider, like, the fact that all the Rukias had this stuff going on in the background, um... It's nice to see this happen for her. I think that because a lot of a lot of people had this. There was this popular theory for a while that eventually each girl would join the, the the Soul Society somehow. But having it be Rukia, who you saw, you know, after the first time skip rise to vice captain, and now after this time skip rise to captain, after she's seemingly mastered her bankai, 
I think that that's a nice conclusion for her. Uh, it's nice to see this person who was not a very low ranked one uh, rise through the ranks, prove herself to people, and eventually have one of the top positions in the entire corps. It's kind of fitting, too, that she becomes captain of the squad that the vice lieutenant she had such a crush on was a part of, too. She's mm-hmm. in Sheehan's division, or Sheba, that, whatever his name was. Uh, Kayan Sheba. Yeah. So, I Kayan, thought, Kayan don't know. Yeah, I think that's a nice little touch there. Although, I, I well, did... No, she also has that... It was a big deal even when she was captain because that position had been vacant for a long time uh, mm-hmm. after his death. And then she took, ended up taking it over. That was a huge deal. Yeah. But the fact um, that she's a captain now, it's... I did think of something that is weird, though. It was that Lisa's been promoted to captain, but if I recall, she was the vice captain of eight before the whole turn back the pendulum thing. Love himself, though, was an actual right. captain. So there's some reason he just yes. either hasn't accepted the position or they're just not offering it to him. He's like, there's not enough... Co- his whole thing, I think, was that he was a pervert, wasn't he? Well, no, because Lisa who was the, a pervert, too. Who the fuck know. even knows? Uh, yeah, Love was the captain of the 7th Division, which Eba took over! <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, how oh, fucking oh. how fucking cruel would it be if next week Eba's like, Vice Lieutenant Love, fetch me my sword! <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, just like, oh come on, man. Maybe that has something to do with it. It's like, because none of the captains actually switched divisions. I don't know. No, oh. but that's actually not the end of the chapter. The end of the chapter is is a uh, Ion. I think that that's his name. The demonic looking guy who was the third seat in twelfth division has apparently taken over as the vice captain. Uh, since Nemu's death, uh, he's uh, busy in the lab, and um, then uh, he hears that Mayuri is not over at the captain ceremony, or as he calls it, that new captain thingy. <laughs> so scientific. Right, he's, so he's like, oh, God, I gotta go and get him. But uh, he says that the reason he actually has to go and retrieve Mayuri is the fact that the instruments are picking up a strange reading similar to Yuhabak's spiritual pressure from 10 years ago, which I believe was probably related to uh, the massive black appearing around uh, Ukitake's gravestone, but maybe not. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's something unrelated. But I'm sure we'll find out next time. That's the only one yeah. that I'm confident that we'll learn about next chapter. <laughs> this is a strange chapter, because I said 10 years have passed here. And time in the soul society flows differently than it does in the real world. Mm. So, mm. it's it, would it, is it soul society is faster than the real world, or the I inverse? I believe that. I believe that soul, that the time society passes more slowly than in. Okay, so more time is even passed in the real world than presumably. Yeah. So more than 10 years have passed. That's a huge jump for these characters. Like, these were all high school kids, and they're all going to be adults now. So I might have that the other way around. Either way, it's still a big time jump. Um, that's kind of interesting. So I'm curious to see, because none of those characters are addressed, and I guess that's what the final chapter is going to be. I guess it's sort of weird to me, because it is more fitting that they're the end of the series. You know, Chad, Ishida, or Hime, Ichigo, like, have those be the end, you know, sort of thing. And this addresses all the Soul Society part. But it's certainly not the way the rest of the series went. So it's going to be kind of almost, like, bittersweet to be like, hey, here's what Chad and Uryu and everyone like that's up to. And you're just like, nothing, I presume, if the last 15 years of this manga have meant anything. I don't know. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, nonetheless. So, we shall see. Okay, so... <clears throat> Boruto? Yeah, uh, let's see here. So, uh, Boruto number four, Spittle Man! Gee, I wonder 
Uh, wonder whose character, whose perspective that quote might be from. Mm. Uh, we open up with Naruto busy with more fucking paperwork in his office. Shikamaru comes in and passes on that uh, Bolt and his teammates managed to pass the second round of the exams, and uh, then Shikamaru just leaves. And uh, so after that, Naruto does a bit of a. <laughs> But then he goes and uh, meets up with Sasuke, and uh, who is down in this weird lab. Like, it feels like something out of a freaking sci-fi uh, uh, pick. Because he's got, it's like they've got this display, and this code is like just on like this holographic column in front of them. Yeah, very technological. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Sasuke says that he's having some trouble actually decoding the scroll that they got. And uh, so, like, okay. Um, but Naruto, before, before Sasuke leaves, says, I hear that you're training my son. And Sasuke says, well, I'll tell you. And he says, no, Konohamaru did. But he says, you know, maybe you're right. The soul of a shinobi remains the same. I'm not sure exactly what that believes, <laughs> what that means. Uh, we cut to the Yuzumaki household. Uh, Himawari embraces Bolt congratulates him for passing, uh, but Bolt just says, I'm kind of tired, so I'm just going to go back, back up to my room. I don't know if I need to do anything. So he goes and he lies down in his bed and he looks at the device that lets him do all of the super special uh, jutsu and stuff, but he hears a knock at the door. He's like, Oh shit, I gotta hide it. And so he pulls his sleeve down, and unexpectedly, Naruto comes in and uh, he says, You know, isn't looking at him he's looking up and Bolt's like what is that it can you just kind of go and Naruto says you did a good job bye and Bolt says what you just came to, to tell me that and he says well yeah you know it's it's important that I tell you that it's really important and he's still seems awkward and unsure and then he kind of goes oh and uh, 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 he puts his fist and uh, he says, don't lose to Shikadai, okay? And Bolt's like, of course I won't do it. But, um... <laughs> Laser attack! Yeah, yeah, okay, Chris, I got it, yeah. <laughs> That's his fault. That's his fault, not mine. Well, technically it's the internet's fault, but whatever. Um, and Bolt is very, like, I don't care when you came to say that. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah, fine. Um, but then Bolt leaves, and Nar and he Naruto, no, rather Naruto leaves, and Bolt's like, "Yeah, oh, that stupid old man." And he's like squeezing his chest, and he's tearing up. Because his dad finally paid attention to him, and finally gave him some props. Isn't that nice? It's town now it's time for you to disappoint him. <laughs> uh, but it. I like the way that the chapter is paced, showing that we're in our art. So, finally, we take a little bit of time to have his baby so to his son, uh, despite how busy he is, and uh, in fact, the way that Bolt's affected by it. And then we go on to one on one contests uh, for round three of the skills, which apparently Rock Lee is conducting. And he's like, I had my limbs crushed in when I took part in this. Make sure that doesn't happen with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Try to avoid sand crushing all your limbs. There's nobody here who controls sand or anything related to that, right? <laughs> Phew. Thank God. Uh, Bolts matched up with. Um, some kid <laughs> from the from the nation. He's lined up with jobber number one, and uh, he basically uh, beats jobber number um, one. <laughs> Someone with bubble magic or bubble whatever. I don't know why bubble ninja arts doesn't really feel like that interesting of a ninja specialty. He, yeah, he summons, like, a bunch of these explosive bubbles, and so Bolt, you know, remembers the conversation they had with his dad, and he gets really determined, and it looks like he throws 
a version of a Rasen Shuriken. I'm not sure exactly what's supposed to be, but he uses some sort of jutsu, throws this shuriken out, and it goes like a boomerang around the field and uh, explodes one of the bubbles in uh, Yurui, the jobber's face. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, he wins. <laughs> he wins. Goes on to the next. Goes on to the next round. We get. A little, a couple of highlights from people here and there. Serata punching a person into the fucking wall. It's like a one moment, like a one hit fight. He just, she's fucking clocks him. Yeah, I love Serata. <laughs> uh, Shikadai manages to take someone out with his shadow jutsu. Mitsuki, we don't even see how he wins. Uh, one of the masked one. Uh, we see two of uh, Gara's students take out the other members of the new Ino she could show. Um, we don't really see what happens with them. Uh, and uh, then we get to uh, round two, the semifinals, as Shikadai takes on Bolt. And uh, now Naruto is watching all the proceedings. Uh, I think we get a couple of exchanges here and there, and Bolt thinks that he's managed to uh, get a hit on Shikadai. But Shigurai manages to just pull out of the way in time for his shadow jutsu to uh, grab a bolt and all the shadow clones that he summoned. And the shadow clones all burst one by one uh, as Shigurai approaches and he's like, okay, you know, I've got you. I've got you dead to rights. And so I think you should, you know, give up at this point. And uh, up in the. I like how up in the bleachers Shigurai is like, looks like my kid wants. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, Bolt manages to move just enough in the shadow binding to uh, get some of the capsules out in order to launch them into... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he does, actually. He he clearly is dropping a bunch of them out, and then a whole ton of shadow clones appear around him. So I'm not sure if he actually managed to launch one of them back into the wrist thing, or if they were summoned from the pill, the capsules, or what. Yeah, well, I think the, the thing is that the... Uh, bracelet dongle actually like, drops. <laughs> bracelet dongle. I don't fucking know the name of it. it's, it's technical name. Technical name now. Yeah. So I think it like essentially shoots out uh, ninjutsu spell scrolls. Kind that of. Might fit. Yeah, I think that's what they've done. So, but in any case, he summons a whole ton of shadow clones that are outside of Shikadai's control, and he's just like, "Yeah, fuck this." <laughs> I like how gracious and defeat he is. He's just like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This isn't worth it. I, I do. I also like the we cut to the bleachers because because uh, Eno's disappointed and Sakura's like, well, this looks familiar. And Tamari's just laughing. <laughs> it's like that's your kid too, but it's like no. It makes it reminds me of when my future husband gave up like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that no uh, Nick. But um. So the only person who isn't reacting, you know, is like, oh, yeah, it was a good match, is Naruto, who's scowling, and Hinata is noticing what a bad mood he's in. And also the scientist who equipped Bolt is like, good, good, it's almost our time. <laughs> Uh, we also cut briefly to the lab where Sasuke's in, and, and um, uh, apparently they finished deciphering the scroll that they found that Sasuke says our suspicions were right. And they're like, well, what should we do? I'll let Naruto know right away. We'll have to postpone the exam. But meanwhile, at the exam, Naruto hops down into the arena, and uh, they're like, what the hell's going on? Um, and, uh, God, it took me a moment to realize that's Kurotsuchi. God damn it. <laughs> and he's like, and she's like, maybe he was overcome by his son's performance. But uh, Bolt, you know, extends his fist out to Naruto like he did before. He's like, yeah, I'm in the final, Dad! And Naruto reaches out, and he grabs Bolt's wrist, and he holds it up and reveals that he's got the, you know, device on his wrist. And he says, Bolt, Boruto, what is this? What's this it's about? Uh, but then we cut away as uh, two mysterious people are approaching and they say, yes, I see them. We're coming for you, Fox. Apparently, they're using some sort of version of the Bakugan. And so they can see the burning QB spirit inside of Naruto. Um, 
I'm just, I don't really know about the you know actual overarching plots of this uh, series yet because we still don't really know enough about them. But in terms of what this chapter did for the development of the relationship between Boruto and Naruto, and seeing you know Naruto the, being the awkward parent who then realized something was wrong, I, I did really like that development. I didn't really care for the chapter also that much. Um, okay. I guess I just don't... It just feels like nothing's changed with Naruto in that I don't understand why he hasn't done this before. I guess I just can't quite understand why he's so busy, but now <laughs> there was an exception that he could make a half-hour time for his kid or whatever. Um, I do think that it would have made more sense if he had actually been watching the proceedings up at this point. Like, he sent a Shadow clone to watch the test and didn't need Shikamaru to come into his office and tell yeah. him happened if he had actually you know, watched some some of the tests and then from there he was like okay this is really important i'm actually going to attend this in person i feel like baruto is just a jim carrey role away from this make being a 90s movie like, just <laughs> like just like baruto on his birthday is like he was too I... busy he was too busy protecting the land of the fire when, and his kid was really upset I <laughs> he just... went to extreme measures to get his dad's attention <laughs> I just wish this birthday, Dad would come home, or I'm gonna do a shit ton of drugs. <laughs> and then it's it's the hard cut to the other side of the '90s. Thing where it's like, this one in my hand is blue. <laughs> Wait, I get to choose ninjutsu to turn to black. Ha! <laughs> now it's not a lie. But it's just the other side of it where Boruto's like, what are you doing? What is this? Who taught you to do this? I learned it from you, Dad. Multiple shadow clones. You can't punish all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I do get your point. Um, I think it's more just seeing Naruto's side of it, seeing the way that his expressions are drawn and his reactions to things is probably what I actually like about this. Um, and also, I do have an appreciation that we didn't focus too much on the actual tournament itself because you know if you recall the tuning exams from originally there was like i don't think that there was a single fight a single one-on-one -on -one fight that we got that didn't have we didn't actually see actually play out like sasuke took out a fucking jobber in over the course of like at least a full chapter mm -hmm. Uh, so the fact that it was just cut down to a montage while showing what B Boruto was actually doing, I think that I much prefer that. Yeah. All right. Fairy Tale, Chapter 497, The Winter Wizard. So we open up with Zerif. Actually, no, sorry, it's Irene, who's on the over the table where Mavis is, basically draining Fairy Heart out of her with, like, a tendril-like wisp and... If you recall, uh, Mavis. Amazingly, had... it's not just like a tentacle that like somehow pumps it out or something. Like, because seriously, I mean, it's already a little bit too suggestive. For it already case, is. Why there's... didn't he just go all the way? Because <laughs> there's still like the the actual physical collar shackle around her neck that's in like imprisoning all of her magic. She's, she's writhing around and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a little bit unnerving, but whatever. Uh, Basically, Irene's actually enjoying this. Like, she's happy to kind of do this extraction. And Zareph's like, well, how long is this going to take? Because I don't want to see her suffer. Because it's apparently a very painful prog uh, process. As I said, she's writhing around. And, and Mavis is doing a lot of, like, uh, uh, screaming kind of shit. Um, and Irene says, oh, well, I didn't think you would be the one person to have emotions. But if I must say something, uh, you know, you have to discard all of those kinds of emotions. Or you'll never be able to defeat Actologia. He is a creature of darkness, of pitchous black. Yes, truly a king of dragons. I'm like, all right, grab that from a metal band <laughs> lyric sheet somewhere. Uh, and Zara's like, yeah, he makes sense. Peace. And he I do really like the... Because he's like, well, I'm just going to leave then. But the way that he looks over his shoulder at Mavis and sees her suffering... It's like, you can still tell that, like, he's just leaving because he doesn't want to see her suffer. Yeah. So. It's a nice little touch. Uh, Irene goes back to essentially doing her torture, and then uh, Nineheart shows up. Uh, the guy with the Radiant Historia magic. Actually, I think it's just called Historia magic. Radiant Historia was a PS2 game. 
Radiant Historia! <laughs> Uh, he says that we've confirmed that uh, they found Urza. Um, she is alive and she wants to know what Irene's orders are. Ur uh, Irene just says immediately, kill her. Uh, uh, Nineheart says, like, oh, well, are you sure? She's like, I don't want to repeat myself. He says, well, my historians don't seem to be able to attack her, I guess, because anything she brings back, he brings back at this point, has been defeated by her. So they recognize it. And she's like, then I suppose you'll have to fight her herself, or yourself. And... Nineheart looks terrified at this. Mm. Like, his eyes basically go inverse. I'm well, not sure if this is supposed to be her magic is taking over him. I, I think that it might be implying that somehow he is subservient to her. Maybe um, his powers are actually a result of something that Irene did to him. Oh my god, are more members of the Spring 12 going to be actually <laughs> just parts of her magic given life? <laughs> Uh, it then cuts away to Urza essentially like like bull rushing and like supercharging her way through combat like you know attacking changing armors still kicking ass mid armor change then changing into a form and you know kicking someone ass again um, guild arts is you know breaking through the guild and we kind of cut around to the various different members of the guilds that are fighting against the Spriggan 12 members uh, Natsu tries to run up to a big group of enemies and use one of his fire breath attacks, but it freezes solid, and everyone starts getting really cold. Uh, Luvia says, like, I can't even use my magic, and Natsu's like, well, I'll heat things up! So he, like, summons this big fire around him, but that freezes too. And then we see Invol, you know, the, uh, secretary guy who's gonna be kind of following Zeref around. And suddenly, everyone is frozen solid with the exception of gray because of his ice magic affinity he doesn't get completely frozen by it but even he comments on the fact that he's getting cold you know that's supposed to be the big reason why he and er never wore clothes is because that was an aspect of ice magic that you had to learn to accept the cold and and be immune to it so this guy apparently has very strong ice magic um it's enough to even kind of send gray packing he says his name's Invel Yura. I bring winter to all I see. And a weak wizard such as yourself, with hardly the strength to freeze an ice cube, will never see the end of my winter. Um, Gray's thinking, like, wow, this is making me cold. This is so crazy. What is this dude? And it, then chapter ends on a shot of Mavis saying, like, someone needs to take down Invel before I'm completely lost. Because it's his magic that's basically sealing her. Right, the ice collar thing. Yeah, so... I like the I like the the uh, sudden buildup that Invil got. It's like, yeah. just froze the entire guild except the guy who has some immunity to it. Uh, I'm assuming that Invil. I don't know if they've ever stayed. I'm guessing he's maybe the Ice Dragon Slayer. We haven't seen maybe. one before, or he could be the Ice God Slayer. That's also a possibility. Right. Um, although God Slaying magic hasn't felt nearly as significant as it was before. So, I'm presuming it's something like that. Some stronger form of ice magic that Grey will have to beat. But uh, next week seems to be that, because it's titled Grey vs. Invil. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's nice to actually have, like, a member of the Spriggan 12 actually do something impressive. Because the last time that they took out an entire guild, it was just so that they could then be defeated because they can't stand the sight of boobs. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's still time. There is still time. Okay. Um, I just want to note, though, I thought the chapter itself was fine. It's, yeah, there's still the fetishy stuff with Mavis, though, that makes it a wee bit uncomfortable at times. But that's fairy tale. Yeah, you gotta take the pedophilia with the bad. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Food Wars, Shokigeki no Soma, Chapter 178, The Shining City. So after those incredibly difficult tests that our heroes had to get through, they deserve a little bit of a break. Um... It's uh, very much just kind of a little bit of a character development chapter, uh, especially focusing on some characters that we don't really get a whole lot of focus on usually, because they split off in kind of weird groups mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. Um, for example, uh, Ikumi and Arina and Megami go off with the younger Aldini brother. And it's like, huh. Okay. When was the last time we saw him do anything? <laughs> um, but uh, basically, they they kind of all have different interests for what parts of the uh, city that they want, uh, uh, Sapporo that they want to explore, and that's why they all go off their own separate ways. 
Um, and so they each split off, uh, and uh, there is a kind of a moment of bit awkwardness between uh, Ikumi and Arina, because it, it plays off of something that we haven't really touched on ever since uh, Ikumi was first introduced to the series, which is the fact that she was a follower of Arina's. She was the one that basically got first sent after Soma in an effort to try and take him down a peg and get rid of him. And the first one to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and they established that, oh yeah, she and Arina were kind of friends. Kind of friends. Yeah. Uh, back then. And uh, Ikumi you know, talks about her own background and the fact that uh, when she was a child, she was being prepared to take on her family's legacy. Um, and in fact, that's helped to define the person that she is now because she didn't want to show any signs of meek girliness. So she had to be strong. And, and that was why she wore an American flag bikini <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it talks about meat. Right. But I mean, I kind of get it. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I get it. She, she, a lot of her life has been related to the fact that she feels she has some role to play kind of opposite of Arena, and how mm -hmm. she's always kind of seen Arena as having an even tougher life, but pulling it off better. Right, and uh, she always, I like the note that she has where it's like, you must have been under way more pressure than I ever was, but you always appeared graceful and acted with dignity, so I've always respected and looked up to you. And then she gets embarrassed from saying the, that, and she's like, I'm going to go over there! <laughs> and... The young girl, Didi, I, I like, I, I like the, the, the chivalry here. He's just like, you yeah, know, we shouldn't let peop, you know, people wander alone out here. It's dangerous, so I'm just going to go with her. He's like, milady, please! <laughs> well, he, doesn't say, he, doesn't say, he doesn't say that. He says, we shouldn't let anyone wander around alone. Yeah. Not, he, and it's, like, it's not like, you know, a girl shouldn't be wandering alone out here. It needs a man to protect her. Yeah, yes. no, I just feel like if anyone in this group would be that guy, it would be the younger Aldini brother. <laughs> Because everyone else we know too well, aside mm -hmm. aside from the two dude bros who totally wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> they totally be like, there's a chick walking home alone. Let's walk behind her and say things while we pose. <laughs> hey, baby, come over here and pop my collar. <laughs> no, no, the other collar. There's six collars. Pop one of them. <laughs> the third collar is the most sensitive. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's my G spot. <laughs> No, really, it's my G-shirt, and I have a spot on it right there. <laughs> um, but uh, this leaves Megami and Irina by themselves to talk a bit. And uh, Irina feels a little bit of guilt because she's like, I, wow, I kind of just abandoned Yukumi after she failed, and I abandoned someone who had that level of respect with it for me, and she still holds me without respect. That's kind of embarrassing. Um, and then she talks a, a bit with... Uh, uh, Megami, and uh, she says, she says, you know, by the way, thank you for making uh, tea the other night. And she's like, oh yeah, you know, I just wanted you to help out because you've been helping us out. You know, if there's anything that I can do for you, you know, I could like, you know, lend you some manga again. And she's like, wait, you're the one that, that Soma got that that shoujo manga from? <laughs> yeah, Soma, the huge shoujo manga fan. <laughs> I thought it was weird. There were so many boy love stories in there. There's so many long limbs that no guy would want to be associated with. <laughs> there wasn't food in any of the series. I found it so <laughs> strange. No girls getting their clothes blown off by super tastes. No bite marks to, to, to indicate that he's been secretly using the manga as ingredients in his <laughs> weird dishes. Uh, but there is a little bit of just, like, actual friendship on it, because Megumi says, you know, we could, like, you know, talk a little bit about the manga you've been reading now. And she's like, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. Actual friendships and stuff forming. Um, but then Takumi and Nick, so much. and the series passed the Birdshell test, finally! Yeah, they had, a talk, they had a talk that wasn't about boys, yeah. I mean, the boys immediately interrupt it, but they still. They do interrupt, but the fact that they're actually sharing some interests that don't have anything to do with the plot is really cool. Um, uh, and Soma <laughs> says that because he and Takumi went around to sample all the dishes that the town could offer and Takumi's like but there's no way we could eat all of them so I figured if we had a large group we could just get a whole bunch of food and just sample them <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You fucking nerds. <laughs> it's a logic I've done before, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, there's, I want to try some more food, but I can't just end, eat the dish myself. Yeah. So all of us just well, sample. I'll yeah. go to something like, uh, we went to Texas State Brazil before, Texas Steakhouse, or uh, Brazilian Steakhouse, sorry. And the whole thing is like, you, you pay $50 or whatever to get in, and then it's like all you eat, all you can eat, so you just flip the card over when you're ready. Now my sister goes, my sister's a vegetarian. She went just because it was with family. So as a vegetarian, she just got the salad bar, but she still got a plate. And I was like, she's trying to give it back. I'm like, just keep your fucking plate there. Keep that green card up. And when a food comes around I want, they'll put a serving on your plate too, and I can just eat that. <laughs> and I can save time waiting for it to come back around. What are you doing? <laughs> but um, they agree to go off together. And there's a moment because uh, Arina is behind the rest of the group, and she sees them all heading off while looking back uh, together. And they're like, what? Do you, are you sure you want to come with us? And she's like, no, no, let's go. And she thinks to herself, I never really looked at things through my own eyes before now, did I? Um, who knew that this city was so beautiful? So a sweet little moment to cap off what is mostly a chapter of just relaxation. But then uh, they get on the train to head off and they discover that um, most of the, the rest of their friends have actually departed. So they're actually being taken on separate trains now as that divergent paths part of the test kicks in. So uh, our group's being divided and conquered, potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but unexpectedly, uh, as their train departs uh, with uh, Takumi and Soma and uh, Megami and Aaron on board, they're approached by Rindo. Uh, and, uh, she's the one who actually explains about the uh, routes splitting off. And she says, by the way, there's been a slight change to the next stage of the test. She takes up her night as for stage three. All of the resistors, including you three, will go head to head with one of the Council of Ten. <gasps> so let's say we have ourselves a fun trip. So... Chris, are you happy with this development now? Yes, this seems to be more intimidating. Plus, there's the idea that we'll get to see more of the Council of Ten, including the members mm -hmm. we don't know much about, like the sword dude and the glasses girl. And there's also the chance that there might be actual consequences to this, because several of the members are completely separated from Arena, don't have her for emotional support right now, and some of those Polaris Dorn members might not fare so well without her, especially with the Council of Ten member as their challenge. Now, I don't think they have to beat them all in a Shokugeki, because that could yeah, be potentially I think fucked be, up. I think that would be on. Unf yeah. yeah. But it still <laughs> seems to be a situation where it's like they're the ones, you know, distributing the test. It has to meet their standards, which are going to be very high, probably higher than a lot of the smaller chefs we've met up to this point. Well, and also when you consider, like, this group has Soma and Megami and Takumi. So it's like, I'm pretty sure that they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Alice, her, her key. But Sure, they're gonna go okay. Others, though. Uh, yeah. I guess Hayama is among the resistors. He'll probably be fun. But um, you know, the dude bros and that one pretty kid. What the hell are they gonna do? Yeah. So yeah, I guess we'll see it plays out. But I did really like this chapter. Um, uh, nice little relaxing uh, character development thing, and then some snapped right back into things are getting really serious now. Uh, let's move on to... My Hero. My Hero Academia. Yes. Chapter 102. Last time, of course, Dad a method of making sure that his arms weren't broken to shit, which was to use a leg focus style combat shoot style. Uh, and uh, it's number 102 on Cloud 9. Uh, we get a little bit of a flashback. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, fuck, ha, ha, it's not Hagakure, because that's the invisible girl. Hayam... Hatsume? Hatsume, yes. I knew we began with a ha, but that's <laughs> all I got. But, uh, yeah, apparently Deku actually did talk over with her wanting to use a leg-focused method of combat, and she's like, oh yeah, that's great, you know, let me whip up some super cute leg accessory babies for you. <laughs> but Deku did caution her, like, well, I don't really want to change the basic look of my current costume. She's like, that's okay, we can do that. Um, and uh, she introduces Costume Gamma, 
which uh, apparently has like reinforced uh, shoes, like uh, steep, like uh, the toes and the boots and stuff. Uh, iron soles specifically. Um, so he gets a little bit of a congratulation with Toshinori, um, and uh, uh, then we see Bakugo actually observing the fact that okay, Toshinori wasn't crushed by that boulder; I inadvertently blew up. Um, and Bakugo says, you better watch yourself. And then Toshinori just thinks to, you know, kind of has this moment of introspection where, because everyone is, you know, was reacting to him being in danger, and he's like, oh, wow. I guess I'm someone who needs protection now. Yeah. It must be so weird for a guy who was basically Superman up until this point. It's a kind of an interesting development. Like, oh, this is a character who's now going to have to accept being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's sort of interesting. So I wonder, I have to imagine there must have been a DC storyline. To this extent at some there point have been there have been plenty of Superman lost his power stories here and there. Yeah, but I guess one that's felt like it's had longer reaching consequence than like a small mini event or something like that. Like something that's been a part of his character for at least a small point in time. Mm -hmm. Or like if he went to a planet that doesn't have yellow sunlight so he's the one who's, who's powerless but everyone else kind of has their power still. Mm -hmm. There was a there was uh, the one time when he just came back from the dead in the 90s where he fought with a pair of guns. That was weird. Okay. <laughs> the 90s were... He had a mullet. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, 90s superheroes. Always great. Um, Deku catches up with uh, some of his classmates who uh, have a few new accessories. Uh, Kaminari and uh, Kirishima in particular get a little bit of focus uh because they've got some new styles to them, but we also see that uh, Todoroki and uh, Jiro and I forget the name of the animal guy. Uh, um, all accessories oh, too. Yeah, fuck! What's his name? Oh, it's gonna bother the crap out of me. It's like a four-letter name. Like G, the Kido. Is it Co is it Coda? Coda. That's it. That's it. Coda. Uh, but they all got they've all got these uh, new little accessories on them. Uh, then we uh, get uh, Class B coming in as uh, Blood King says, "All right, come on, guys. We're sp it's supposed to, this is supposed to be you know our, our you know tr our training gowns for uh, for now." And Aizawa says, "We've got ten minutes left in our training. Come on." <laughs> that one asshole from Class B is there. <laughs> I don't even know his name. He's that one asshole, <laughs> douche guy, Captain yeah. Douche Nozzle. But he, and he says, haven't you heard? About half of those taking the licensing test are going to fail. So I bet you'll all fail. And they're like, what the hell is up with your costume? You look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Tokiyami does say, like, well, no, he is right. You know, we've got to be, we've got to work really hard on this because if, we've got such a low success rate here. Um, <laughs> we get a bit more comedy from uh, Manoma with him, you know, trying to keep up appearances and stuff because Aiza says, well, we're not actually going to be competing against each other. Classes A and B are going to be at different exam sites. And Manoa very obviously breathes a sigh of relief and he's like, what a shame, I won't be able to beat you guys. <laughs> and they're like, he totally just sighed relief. Yeah, he did. <laughs> there's like, there's, there's so many people on the other side of that class that are so likable, but they don't show up nearly as much as the super douche. <laughs> Where's Tetsu Tetsu? <laughs> Tetsu Tetsu or Shinso? Wasn't he in that class? Uh, I think you're right, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, we get a bit more time focusing on, by the way, it's not, you're not, you guys aren't just competing amongst each other. You guys are going to be competing with other schools who are going to be there, too, which is something that's followed up at the end. Um, we get a bit of a conversation amongst the girls after the day's training. You know, they're all hanging out in casual gear. Uh, Yairozu indicates that she's got some ideas for her ultimate techniques in mind, but she, but her body's not quite there yet. She still needs to enhance her quirk a bit. Uh, Suyu says that she's trying to work on some frog techniques. Uh, Uraka is distracted because she's got a crush on Deku and Ashido immediately is like she's in love and she's like what no I'm not no which one are you in love with is it Ida you're always hanging out with, with him is it Midoriya you're always hanging out with him too and she's just like I like her reaction which is to curl up into a ball and float up into the air <laughs> float off into space 
<laughs> like, tell us, the truth will set you free. No, I'm not in love, I swear. <laughs> but uh, as a result of her floating around aimlessly, uh, she ends up seeing outside as Deku is still in the midst of training. Um, and Deku is still trying to figure out his moves as she's still like, it's not, totally don't, not in love, that's not in love. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's. I wish that we had that. This weren't as big a focus for Uraraka at this point because her last several appearance have just been built around her crush on Deku. Yeah, it's it's been a long time since that fight with Bakugo, mm -hmm. where we saw a strong character from her that wasn't just her crush on Deku. So I'd like to kind of return to that at some point. The issue with it has just been she hasn't really done anything of importance since then like mm. even Ida at least got to go on the mission to rescue Bakugo she didn't take part in that she really didn't have any kind of pivotal role I mean she had a small role inside the um, the uh, attack on the sleep camp where she helped fight against Toga but it wasn't anything and that, even that was still revolved more around like, Deku's I trash I can tell you I love oh I can smell the maiden spirit on you <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean... Yes, I, thought, I can smell that purity coming right from your loins. Sure. Just like mine. So creepy. Yeah. My delicate feminine loins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my blooming flower. <laughs> oh, I hope no one plucks it. <laughs> like, I don't like Thomas much anymore. Um, but, yeah, it's just a matter of, like... I don't mind that this is happening with her. I just wish it weren't the only thing going on with her. Exactly. No. The exam arrives, and uh, we see the group coming off of a bus, approaching the, the test facility, and uh, they're like, all right, we, here we go. You know, we got to try and get that stuff. And I was always like, you've got to get those hero licenses. Um, and, you know, if with this... Uh, you can earn your provisional licenses. You won't need me or eggs anymore, but full-fledged hatchlings. I guess, yes. They're like, so you don't do speeches enough, do you? Well, it could, but they react really well yeah. to it, because they're like, yeah, we'll hatch from those eggs! <laughs> um, and uh, they get ready to do their plus ultra chant, but all of a sudden, a stranger runs up to them and, fi and finishes it. And uh, they're like, what? What was going on? And uh, he's the man is the, the guy is scolded by uh, his group. They're like, "Come on, man! You, you can't just be intruding on people's group huddles like that." He's like, "Oh, sorry." And he does like this. It's like a standing dogeza, where he just very enthusiastically bows his head to them, bows so hard and and deeply that he smashes his head into the ground. <laughs> And uh, they're like, who the hell is that guy? But they realize that uh, all the uh, people in the group are wearing uniforms. And they're like, oh, it's, it's them. It's the Western version of, of the UA, Shiketsu. Uh, there is this one of the few elite hero schools that can rival UA. Um, and the guy who bowed to them says, oh, I've always wanted to try same plus ultra. I freaking love UA high. <laughs> But it says, it's going to be an honor competing alongside you guys. Um, but they, Aizawa says, that's Inasa Yorashi. And they say, oh, you know him? And he says, well, he's really enthusiastic, but from what he's saying, he's, uh, but, uh, he's very strong. Uh, he's, uh, in, his, in this year, he got placed into your grade at UA under very special recommendation. His top grades were enough to open the doors for him, but for some reason, he decided not to matriculate what a word. <laughs> like, we get it. You're a teacher. But, uh, yeah, they say that he would have been, he would have been. <laughs> they see him on his phone immediately afterwards, like, and, uh, let's see what else my word of the day <laughs> Wikipedia! <laughs> <laughs> let's just see what other, uh, interesting words I could just the cast. .com. I could just casually toss into conversation, like, oh, I don't know. Uh, hey, has anyone been purblind today? Uh, perhaps maybe I could rile you up. That's a small one. Oh, you're all unfledged. Yes, I just came up with that one. I'm going to destroy this phone so you can't prove me wrong. <laughs> you know, the fact that we're working against anarchists means that we're an anti-disestablishmentarianism movement, you know. <laughs> I can spell it, too. Do you want me to spell it? <laughs> 
X fuck <laughs> yeah cute <laughs> what are you uh, but uh, Deku notes wait a minute if he was a if he's a first year who's got special recommendation in top ranks does that mean he could be even better than Todoroki um, so building up the fact that since they've got to match up against these students they're, they're going to actually have some tough competition in provisional hero licenses which is good yeah, and this is actually a really cool and interesting kind of development for uh, My Hero because we get to see a whole bunch of new students and we can build some of these guys a little bit more up to be not necessarily villains because they also go to a hero school, but they can be more antagonistic than I think you would find believable in a lot of the other ways. Now, you can still have fights between like the other classes where you're like, if Tetsu won fight Tetsu Tetsu, you'd be like an honorable kind of thing, but you still just need characters who can be someone you want to root against and i think that's gonna be easy with a whole group of characters to kind of work with right on and uh we already covered nisekoi so i guess we'll talk a little bit about uh fuck. One, one piece yeah oh fuck i almost i almost completely skipped and just went on to to uh promised everland yes but uh <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, we're sorry uh, running late so. yeah I'll, I'll take over one piece too um so we start off the chapter, chapter 835, The Kingdom of Soul, uh, with some weird blobby black mess who is uh, telling everybody to leave all life, leave all life. And everyone clearly is accepting leave, I think. Or maybe life. accepting life. I assumed, I don't know why, I assumed leave meant leave your soul and life meant I'll kill you otherwise, but actually we do find out they're only staying yeah. there. So yeah, it's the inverse. He, he takes a portion of their life and like plunks it into a basket. And we cut back to the giant head in the ground, and uh, Luffy and all the tied up members of Luffy's friends. And I love just, this bit, <laughs> this bit right here. He's just like, oh, they're making animal sounds, like Sanji, <laughs> pudding, <laughs> chopper, <laughs> carrot, <laughs> Nami, untie me. What? <laughs> well, well, I'm talking like a person. That's because it is me. <laughs> And the next shot's just him beat up in the face. <laughs> uh, oh, God. But they, they comment on the fact that they all look like them, and they're, they're not really sure why that is. It's so strange. And Luffy's like, well, what happened? And they explain, well, it's because you attacked us. You know, you betrayed us. That person that looked like you tricked us. And because of that, this woman came up behind me. She grabbed me. I only managed to get away. You know, she shows her using the climate baton, which she keeps between her bosom. Uh, I suppose that's actually the best area to keep it, considering Nami's usual attire. Uh, she actually uses it, extends it, knocks Brulee away. Uh, as she's flipping away, she actually says, Thanks, Usopp. Uh, and Brulee looks like she's about to attack. Carrot dashes in, uses her claw attack. Uh, but turns out this chick has the mirror devil fruit. Kind of makes sense, considering some of the things we've seen here. Uh, Carrot tries to attack again and literally gets sucked into the mirror, trapped inside of it. And she explains this is a mirror world that you can't get out of. Yo mama already knows you're all here, and everyone here is working undercover. Him, him, him. Well, not that guy. Like, she specifically points... Well, she doesn't point him out, but she never points to the dude whose face is stuck <laughs> in the She's like, that tree! Those flowers! Those ones over there! <laughs> <laughs> and but, even the rabbit! <laughs> yeah, she says, uh, don't let any of them meet Sanji. Make them rue the day they ever tried to mess with me. So their goal is basically just to occupy the straw hats and capture them kill them do whatever they need to do to make sure they don't go it so brule says time to work homies which at first i thought was just her slang term but apparently that's the actual name for these creatures these are basically things that big mom has put these collected bits of life from people from it gives them life and they are thus called homies uh, chopper basically says nami get away i'll stay here to keep them from going after you and that's basically where we end up now. Um, the big guy explains how Chopper was taken down, how the uh, spear, or the uh, various creatures, trees, all that stuff, despite how big Chopper was, ruthlessly attacked him like they had no other kind of uh, uh, option in the matter, that they were going to complete uh, an order. And he explains how their powers work, uh, or how the power came to be, how Big Mom has the soul soul fruit, and she has the ability to take and use life force from others, so she has everybody donate in this kingdom two months of their souls or sorry two months essentially every year so basically she everyone loses two months for every year they live in this kingdom but it's their way of kind of living in peace 
And Big Mom uses that power to essentially create this army of fucking everything around her. Uh, the man explains how he knows this. It's because he was the husband of uh, Big Mom way back when. He had two daughters with her, and then she abandoned me. Um, at which point, the man grabs the guy by his head, like the tuft of his hair, pulls him out of the ground, at which point everyone realizes this man is not a giant. He's just a dude with an extremely large head and hands. <laughs> and the guy who's pulling him out is Charlotte Cracker, the tenth son and one of the sweet three general uh, minister of biscuits of Big Mom's army. So he's one of the big three, like, lieutenants. Um, and he's got quite a beard. Yes, a very big beard and an ar a suit made out of crackers, which is very uh, a unique armor. I hope he has some kind of strength that he power. Crackers <laughs> seem like a bad defense. Uh, the big guy basically explains how, you know, he just wants to be left to go see Chiffon. I heard she got married. I want to congratulate her. And I heard that, like, Rolo ran away from home, and she's a priceless family to me. So this is confirming, then, that Lola we met way back when in Thriller Bark actually is one of Big Mom's family. Kind of already knew that. But it's specifically one of this guy's kids, and it seems like he had two kids who didn't turn out to be shitheads. Mm-hmm. Well, quite a few of... Uh, of Some of them aren't bad at all, but... Right. Yeah. Um... But yeah. Push the plot forward a bit. <clears throat> uh, Promise Neverland, honestly, not as much to talk about this time. Basically, they find out that uh, Mama uh, can track them all with uh, because apparently they their theory is that they've got some sort of uh, transceiver implanted in their body, and they. But the main thing that I like about the chapter is that all these weird little things that should have tipped them off. Uh, in the first place, all suddenly stand out like sore thumbs now that they know that something is going on and everything about there, what they thought was a paradise, now it just seems like a way of keeping them under control. And I like the sense of paranoia that's uh, being built up for them. That's about all I have to really say about it. Yeah, I, it was a good chapter. I like how even the characters are in the story questioning why it would matter if they were intelligent or not. And that's yeah. something they still haven't kind of figured out. So a lot of questions still to, still to ask, but I like some of the, I really just more than anything, just like the feel of things where they're, they're, re, they're realizing, man, it, it was kind of weird how mama always knew where to hide it, where to find us if we were hiding. She just knew immediately, uh, well, you know, we, uh, why didn't we question all of these weird things before and stuff? Mm -hmm. Uh, moving on briefly to Toriko, Gourmet 382, Acacia makes his move. Um... He kills well, a lot basically the other happen. king. He basically kills the other kings. I think the only one really left is uh, Guinness at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and even he took a pretty bad blow. So. He essentially destroys almost all of them. I don't think that they actually established him killing the dragon. Uh, he goes for the attack. The dragon fires and... Oh, no, sorry. Um, he kills the whale king and the snake king. The dragon tries to fire, Nitro eats it, and then he kind of gets absorbed. So yeah, they don't show the the dragon dying either, I don't think. Right. Uh, the remaining blue Nitro says, you know, you should, you should eat your host. You know, you know, says to Neo, you must eat Acacia, eat your host, and then, I can't move. You use knocking when... And Acacia says, shut up, <laughs> I hope he talks exactly like that. You use knocking when... <laughs> Uh, and Acacia s says, Ah, Neo, you're just what I expect from my appetite. I know how it must sound coming from me, but you're so strong. Your power is mine now. And it seems as though he just kind of absorbs it. Because we don't see him eating it. Yeah, well, it's actually kind of like a cutaway. He says, your power is mine now. And then we cut away to, it looks like Froze has finally beaten Starjune. And then she turns and she's like, ah, you did it. Great job, Acacia. And he's and become a Dragon Ball Z character. No, I am a super serene. <laughs> it's really like, I know that all the manga from our current generation have a heavy Toriyama influence in them. But this right here, I'm like, if you put this in Dragon Ball Z, I would have perfectly believed it was like a new original Toriyama work. It just has that color scheme and muscle structure. And the hair. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I guess Acacia is finally 
in his full super ultra definitely the last form now. <laughs> He's been through a lot of form changes recently. Freaking Eisen over here. I know, right? Uh, but uh, that's it. That's that's what happened to Rico. He wrecked a bunch of house, and now he is super, super strong. Uh, let's move on, finally, to World Trigger. World chapter Trigger! 100, 153. Uh, what is this one freaking called? Tatsuhito Ikoma. And last time, Osamu almost got uh, tracked down, but he managed to get... Uh, two of the members from each uh one member from each team to start fighting each other instead and now he's basically summing up his uh, his options to himself i was like okay i could stay here and wait for kuga i probably won't be spotted but then i'm not gonna be able to do anything i could go try to catch up with kuga but there's probably someone waiting there for me to intercept me i could go southeast where there's nobody around but i might end up out of bounds or i could go west to where ikoma squad is positioned that's actually probably my safest option if I can manage to get past them because then they'll be blocking off me off from OG. So when OG squad tries to pursue me, they'll class against each other. So I guess I'll do that. Um, and we immediately cut over to OG who's thinking to himself, he's probably going either west or north. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he's, well, he's thinking to himself, yeah, he probably will go past Ikoma squad and use them as a shield. And so his squad mate's like, well, then what should we do? Uh, should we go south and pick up Kashio? Uh, so we, uh, and and so he's like, okay, we'll go pick up Kashio, and then we're gonna keep on going after uh, Osamu. And as long as he's forced to keep on running, he won't be able to set up the wires. Uh, so I like specifically that when this plant, when this group talks about uh, tactics and positioning, they use the stupid icons they came up before for the characters, and but, everyone else uses the normal icons. <laughs> yeah, which, by the way, uh, we talked about it last week. It actually is confirmed that uh, uh, Ashihara was using Asui from uh, uh, My Hero for the one character because he mentions oh, that in the, he mentions that in the author's comments at the end of this week how he had permission to use it. <laughs> I like that little touch. Oh man. Uh, so yeah, they they decide to do that um, head, and head off. Uh, we catch up to the fight itself and. Uh, what is it? Kura. 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 What is this for? Kurauchi is his full name. But OG squad, OG calls him Kura Boy. Uh, he uses a technique called Salamander to uh, finish off the fight and uh, take out. Uh, what's his face? White haired uh, dude. Let's not memorize all these characters' whatever. names. They're not the leader of their squad. <laughs> Basic, basically, the white-haired guy who's from, who's from uh, Ikoma Squad, uh, Kai, uh, gets uh, distracted by this huge blast that gets let off, and that gives uh, Karachi uh, an opening to take him down. Um, and uh, so they analyze, oh, the salamander technique. It's, a, it's, not, it's you know, not a sniper, but it's still got a long range, and it's quite destructive. Uh, and Ikoma Squad... <laughs> Is reacting to this because it comes like, come on, man, we can't be the first to lose like this. Our selling point is that we're a four-man <laughs> squad. If we lose a guy, we've got nothing but Oki's popularity with girls. <laughs> and, o and Oki chimes in. He's like, I'm, I'm not actually popular, really. I'm not. <laughs> it's not our thing. <laughs> uh. I want this dude to just like persist throughout the series. Like he's constantly on missions never addressing the plot at hand always he's essentially like if you just put me into this manga and i've just decided to be a constant like no sell to everything going on i'm just always in a tangent unrelated to the plot like i'm always just like man wouldn't it be great if i could have a house with great resale value like this like as the like entire arena is getting destroyed around me like i'm just like when is my mortgage rates gonna go down right why can't i live in a virtual house uh, Zoe basically analyzes that OG is similar to Mikumo. He thinks things through before acting, and so maybe their thought processes are the same. And I like that. That's interesting. The fact that they come up with similar strategies, and so that's why Osama's getting caught at every turn, is because there's someone who just thinks like him. Uh, but apparently, Tamakoma has accounted for this as suddenly. Yuma comes flying in and starts to take on all three members of OG Squad by himself. Uh, and uh, But uh, after a brief distraction, he manages to cut off one of their arms 
and then uh, another one gets shot in the leg by uh, Chica's lead bullet. Uh, so that manages to slow down them down from being able to pursue after Osamu. Um, but OG is like, okay, let's uh, you know reposition around here. Let's get out of let's get out of. Uh, I'm a I'm a Trishiana's line of sight. Yeah, he just sucks with names. <laughs> But, uh, he's he's uh, also us in this series. He's just, just like, I, what's this dude's name? Fucking Catman. <laughs> but you manages to cut them off with the grasshopper to prevent them from getting out from out in the open. Uh, so then they can still be uh, stopped from having uh, from being able to pursue Osamu. So Oji has to think to himself really quickly, okay, should I have one of them uh, go off to pursue Osamu? Uh, should we use all three of us to try and take out Cougar? Uh, what what do we do? Um, and uh, so yeah, good good stuff. Uh, but then all of a sudden, Ikoma comes in and he's like, "I may be a joke character, but I'm also a badass." <laughs> he's like, "Remember, I'm a goggles kid." <laughs> Uses a technique called Kogetsu Whirlwind. Just sends out this like shock wave from his Kogetsu. Yuma manages to get his sword up to block part of it, but he still takes a a pretty significant wound to his side. And Ikuma's like, Wait, how come you... How are you still in one piece? And Yuma apparently has been uh, preparing for this, studying the logs, but uh, it's uh, the range of his kogetsu is apparently longer than he suspected, which is why he was still wounded. So we've got a clash between all three captains plus some company going on here. Well, not all three captains. What am I talking about? But some not the captain. All three aces. <laughs> yeah, all three all aces. All three aces. It's interesting. Osama or uh, Osama Yuma is in a really bad spot too, because I mean we know he has the grasshopper, so he has mobility. But now he's taking damage, and he's surrounded by four different guys who are all kind of going to be gunning for him. Um, he has at least the advantage that one person from that's also on opposite team, so that kind of puts a little bit of a wrinkle in some stuff. But it's a bad position for Yuma to be in because we know that he could beat almost anybody in B rank squad one on one, but the times he starts getting his ass kicked is when there are multiple people so it'll be kind of interesting how he kind of handles some this and if he's able to you know round about and reunite with osamu somewhere mm -hmm. so yeah uh enjoyable chapter i would say um so i think that's gonna do it that's gonna do the recap portion of a week longer recap let's finish things off by choosing our mvps and uh series of the week uh, I'll go first then. I think that I enjoyed World Trigger best this week. I thought it was a fun chapter. I like that we're getting some small things happening. There's already been a, a bailout within the chapter and Tomokoma got no part of it. So we're already kind of building up that sense that Tomokoma is not going to win this one handily if they win it at all. Um, and I really like that when, uh, what's his name? I, I, for Elkoma, sorry. When Elkoma came down, you know, he's this goofy, silly, stupid character, but you also might forget he's a badass. You know, he's the reason why he's one of the top, the leader of one of the top ranked teams. So I thought it was a very cool kind of uh, way to build him up and realize, like, oh shit, this is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. I had a, quite a bit of difficulty, honestly, picking uh, my favorite this week because although there are a bunch of good chapters, None of them stood out as being, like, really good. None of them seems to stand out above the crowd very well. So I've gone with Food Wars, uh, but I think that we had a bunch of good chapters this week, and I'm not particularly like, it's got to be this one for this reason. I just kind of like, I just like what we got from it. I liked the character building, and I liked the development at the end. I can completely understand. Uh, my character of the week, my character MVP, is uh, Asta, the Black Clover. It was... Uh... A really good chapter for him. I like the fact that I'm able to enjoy that character a lot better. You know, he seems like he has a lot more sympathetic qualities to him, or admirable qualities, I should say. Asta had the best character moment for this week, which is why I'm going with Asta as my MVP as well. Boosh! There we go! Nailed it! Uh, and, uh, let's see here. What was the winner of the poll? It was One Piece, it looks like. I can't see the whole poll. Uh, let me see here. I can give you an exact confirmation on that uh yes one piece won the poll it was actually right behind that was a uh, promised neverland promised neverland was only a few votes behind and then world trigger after that but uh shockingly this is one of the few weeks where my hero didn't have a big impact at all 
I think it was just because it wasn't a particularly eventful week for My Hero Academia. It was more just follow-up for, yep, Deku uses his legs now to fight, and also a little bit of build to what we're going to actually see. Uh, I think the Uraraka thing is really what kind of held it down. I don't think there's anybody who's really all that invested in that. Right, it's 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 not that that's bad, it's just... It, like four or five chap, uh, four or five pages were like spent on that. They could have been spent on something much more intriguing. Mm-hmm. So there we go. Okay. And uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us for weekly manga recap. We tend to record the show uh, Wednesdays at seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Though sometimes we do need to change things up, so be sure to follow us on social media so that you can stay updated on the changes that we have to go through. Uh, you can follow us at RolloT, at Yruler of Time, at WMR Podcast, and uh, we'll you know when we're starting the show up. Yes. And yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to note now, uh, if you go to, for the longest time we had up in the corner there, also uh, YouTube.com slash Weekly Manga Recap, that does now finally actually go to the site. It's for the longest time I had so much issues getting YouTube's like custom URL feature to actually work, but I believe now it should be working for everybody. After like a year of trying to get it working. <laughs> yeah, it was a while. It, it was at least like eight months of trying to get it. They keep changing their fucking qualifications for like what you needed. God. It was like you need four months of a good standing channel. It was like four months came by. They're like, man, I need six months. <laughs> it's like, God damn it. Uh, and, uh, let's see, what else do we gotta do? Um, so, here's the thing. I know I didn't name a recommendation last week, and I do have it this time. Uh, the thing is, I had to think to myself, well, crap, I've got to reread Bleach in preparation for my trivia contest with, with Tech King. So I thought, all right, I think that this is the prime time for us to do, to do another edition of Pokemon Oh, god damn it! (laughs) So I have to reread Bleach and Sorry. Pokemon. <laughs> do you need me uh, to do a no, short series fine. instead? That's fine. I'll do. I'll. I'll manage. Uh, a little bit of a heads up to those of you who uh, uh, did what Chris did last time, getting a bundle of the volumes. Part two. I don't know why the fuck they did this, but all of part two is contained in the second set of seven volumes, except for literally one chapter. Is in the th- is in the third bundle. It's in volume fifteen instead of volume fourteen. So, <laughs> okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that'll be good to know. Uh, should also note, guys, the Patreon account. Uh, if you guys are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can do that at patreoncom recap. We have various different rewards that are offered for those who are patrons for us, including the five dollar a month champion bonus pod. Uh, which, as we said this week, or uh, this month, is going to be the Trollo T trivia between Nick and Tekking. And I want to give a special thanks. We actually have quite a few uh, new patrons uh, since then, so I just want to I want to give everybody here a proper shout. So we have Mauricio Suervo, uh, thank you, Justin Botlet, Brandon Wright, Jelly Elfson, Mark Shaw, Connor Slaybaugh, Graham Canyon, Yidkirkin, Yidkirkin, Alex Flynn, so on. And so forth. That's not me being pretentious. That's also that's actually the person's name there, and so on and so forth is the last person. So I want to thank everybody there for that. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. Mm-hmm. Also, I think we had uh, on iTunes, guys. If you can, if you could please uh, give us a five star rating there. If you're enjoying the show, it greatly helps us out. We got some again from uh, Marcico Suervo, uh, and uh, also from some guy on IT who uh, gave us a five star view. So. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, it is very helpful. It manages to help us stay relevant in the eternal battle that is the iTunes hobby podcast section. Uh, we're always struggling to stay where we are. We're 81 right now. That's huge. 81. But there's, I still see, I still see woodworkers above us. That has to change. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, if you want to send some stuff to us, suggestions for future manga for us to read, questions for a future Q and A episode, even just to you know comment on what you think of the show, uh, you can send that stuff to Weekly Manga Recap at yahoo.com. And don't forget, as Chris Man announced earlier, he is trying to prepare something for the trivia contest. So if you want to answer a couple of questions, send that to us as well. Yes, 
Yeah, it's, uh, it'll only take a few moments, so I'm not trying to take up anybody's time. They're really simple questions to answer. And, of course, the people who help bring our podcast to you, Steve Manor, tire car artist, and Infamous Planet. Uh, thanks. So uh, I guess we'll see you guys next time for what uh, will probably be just a discussion of Bleach then. Well, no, I guess I don't know if we're doing anything next week. I think that we'll have to figure things out. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Uh, it's it's. Uh, well, difficult. maybe we'll take. Well, we, maybe we'll just take the week off to prepare for our special things later in the month. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a little bit busy. So uh, there'll be we'll, we'll mention what's going on, but uh, we'll keep yeah. you guys updated. Or I might just take the week off to watch Olympics. Who knows? <laughs> They're only around once every four years, guys. Well, well the once ones, the, the good ones. Good ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard someone on another podcast say, "Yeah, we can all agree the summer, or the winter Olympics are the good ones, right?" And everyone on the podcast agreed. And I've never—it's like my favorite podcast. I never felt so alienated before in my life. I was like, "What? Just because it has hockey? What else is there? Ice skating and nineteen different variations of skiing slash snowboarding, and that's it?" Well, there are nineteen different variations of swimming at the summer Olympics. Yeah, but there's also the track and field next to it, and martial arts, and boxing, and volleyball, and beach fencing. volleyball, and fencing. fencing, and weightlifting, and uh, yeah, I got ba- it. Ba- or, uh, not baseball, basketball. Like, there's other good events beyond like two, you know. All right, USA, USA, <laughs> USA, USA.